I'm Dr. Archila Gunasekar Rockwell, the Assistant Editor of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs and Senior Event Planner for the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. On behalf of these two organizations, I would like to welcome you to this roundtable discussion, the fall of Afghanistan. The original intent of this event was to highlight journal articles tackling the topic of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the events of the past few weeks have radically altered the focus, which will instead turn to what the future holds for Afghanistan in the wake of its collapse and the resurgence of the Taliban. We have brought together a very diverse group of scholars, including academicians, military officers with real world experience in the theater and a former official in the Kazai administration. Before we begin, I must read the following disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this round table are those of the participants and should not be construed as carrying the official sanctions of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University or other agencies or departments of the US government or their international equivalents. Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel, beginning with our moderator. Dr. Ernest Gunasekar Rockwell holds his PhD from the University of Wisconsin Medicine. He currently serves as the editor in chief of the Journal of Indo Pacific Affairs and director of the Consortium of Indo Pacific Researchers. Earlier, he served as the acting dean of the Air Force Research Institute and Managing Editor and Acting Director of the Air University Press. Dr. Monish Thorambam earned his PhD in International Relations with a specialization in American Studies from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Currently, he teaches postgraduate students in the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He's a student affairs coordinator of the department and coordinator for the Northeast Studies Center. Additionally, he serves as the honorary director for the Kalinga Institute for Indo-Pacific Studies think tank. Colonel Wayne Straw, US Air Force, is the chair of the Department of International Security Studies at the US Air War College, Air University. Colonel Stroh holds multiple master's degrees from Air War College, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, the College of Naval Command and Staff, and Florida State University. He's a combat veteran, having served in operations enduring freedom, Northern Watch, Southern Watch, two years in Afghanistan, AFPAC, heads embedded with Green Beret, 455th. Expeditionary Operations Support Squadron, Bagram Airfield with US Central Command and Air Force Center Tours. Colonel Patrick Bajenska, US Army, is chair for the chair of the Department of Strategy at US Air War College, Air University. Colonel Bajenska earned a master's in strategic studies from Air War College. His major assignments include G1. 10th Mountain Division, Fort Drum, New York. While assigned to 10th Mountain, he deployed to Afghanistan as the CJTF-10 CJ-1 for Regional Command East Bagram Airfield. Prior to the 10th Mountain, he served as the Deputy J-1 for United States Forces, Afghanistan, Kabul. Colonel Bajinska served in the G-1 section and as the Inspector General for United States um, South Sam, Fort Sam Houston. He was assigned twice to the Army Deputy Chief of Staff G1, the Pentagon, and also served as the 75th Ranger Regiment S1, during which he also deployed to Afghanistan. As an infantry officer, Colonel Bachenska served in the 1st Infantry Division, Germany, and the 100 and 1st Airborne Division, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Uh, Shajan Ahmed Sai has a bachelor's degree in international studies and master's in public administration 
with the public policy concentration. He currently serves as director of the Center for Afghanistan Studies at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Previously, he served in various positions within the Office of the President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Anwar Jain is an assistant senior researcher and writer for the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers and a research analyst at the, at the NATO Association of Canada. His work focuses on grand strategy trends with, within the South Asia and Euro-Atlantic context, and he has been published in numerous fora, including the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs. He's also currently affiliated with the Canada-Tibet Committee. He holds an honors degree in international relations from the University of Toronto, and he's entering the law school at the University of Ottawa. And now, without further delay, I would like to invite the moderator, Dr. Gunasek, Ernest Gunasek Rockwell, to begin the roundtable discussion. Thank you. Apparently the Zoom gods don't want us to have two uh, sessions going on at the same time here in the house. So uh, pardon the exchange of seats here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you to the, the panelists for, for coming. Uh, you all bring with you uh, some substantial experience in the region and uh, with the uh, allies and the partners that we have therein. Uh, I also want to thank all of the participants. Uh, we're right now at about 180 participants, and uh, we had over 300 people sign up for this, which is extraordinary for us. Uh, and I, ho I hope it uh, hope we keep that ball rolling moving forward with our future events. Uh, so let's just jump. I've got some pre-made questions, and then uh, if if you as participants have questions, and I'm sure some of you do, uh, be sure to put those over in the chat box for us, and we'll try to get the, to those as we after we finish these uh, prepackaged uh, questions that we have. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll direct these towards uh, one individual to, to begin with, but these are questions that everybody can jump in on uh, after the uh, first speaker gets done uh, tackling it. Uh, just kind of give me a, a hands up so I can call on someone, uh, so we we don't have a, a all out brawl to to, to uh, determine who's speaking. Uh, so the first question I'm going to throw out there uh, for Manish, uh, why did the Biden administration opt to pull out of Afghanistan in such a rush? And why did the administration fail to make corrections in the face of the Taliban onslaught? Follow on to that, uh, what is the response to this in New Delhi? And what might it mean to the Quad? Okay, uh, thank you, Anis. Uh, uh, to begin with, uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for the opportunity. And um, uh, it's a real privilege to be talking along with people who have surfed in the ground and who have real world experience. Uh, jumping on to uh, the questions that is uh, uh, put forward to me, I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it didn't come as a surprise uh, to people looking at uh, US policy towards Afghanistan in New Delhi. Uh, uh, as far as the withdrawal policy was concerned, you know, I think the dice was already rolled uh, with the peace agreement last year that the U.S. was good. Uh, you know, it was kind of a foregone conclusion that the U.S. was going to withdraw its forces. And I think uh, uh, what came uh, perhaps uh, because, uh, you know, I think it's quite clear in all the media uh, accounts that uh, as the vice president, he was... Uh, his, his, his ideas of the troop search in 2009 and uh, how he looked at counterterrorism and not uh, counterinsurgency or nation building and all of those. So it didn't come as a surprise, uh, first of all. Um, I, I, I think um, the, as everyone uh, is saying, the speed with which uh, the government fell and the troops sort of like uh, fell uh, in the onslaught of the Taliban, that I think came as quite a surprise to everyone, including in the U.S., uh, even in Pakistan, I guess, uh, not to think, not to talk of other countries. Uh, I think uh, in 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 New Delhi, I think uh, there for some time there was some discussions about uh, you know practically two groups of uh, analysts, uh, former uh, officials and others, uh, one who look at uh, Taliban as a group that uh, you know. Uh, India should not uh, have anything to do with. And I think 
there has been an evolution. There has been a trend. You know, I, I remember a time when as a young academic, every time I went into a conference room and talk a little bit about why not talk, start opening channels, um, I, I, I would get like frowning eyes from a lot of senior people. Uh, I think if you look at the discussion in the strategic community in New Delhi, it has come a full circle. There is, there are a lot of commentaries now. There are a lot of people now who are coming out and saying that, well, you know, talking to the Taliban, it's not such a bad thing as well, as long as we have uh, clear red lines in what we can expect from the Taliban when we engage with them. And I think this was clear also from the Moscow conference where because the Afghan government was not represented as such. So we could not have a uh, official representation, but we did send two former diplomats who had, uh, who had, who had served in Afghanistan in some form or the other uh, to open channels informally with, uh, with, with those who had come from the uh, Taliban side. So I think in, 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 in that sense, there has been a full circle in New Delhi. Uh, uh, there, you know, there also has been a debate for a long time in New Delhi in terms of like what beyond the $3 billion of aid and assistance in the civilian reconstruction. Um, you know, I, I remember talking to uh, 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 Afghan diplomats uh, giving me a list of complaints about what India could have done and did not do, uh, leading me to write an article uh, with, the, uh, with the title uh, does India give Afghanistan what Afghanistan needs or does India give Afghanistan what India can give? So I think there, there was a, so I think uh, th there's always been a debate about like, uh, uh, but uh, of what India can do more, especially in terms of training military forces. Uh, and there has, uh, there was a clear cut idea in terms of saying that, wait, no boots on the ground, you know? So I think from, from taking it from there, uh, I feel that uh, the big debate in New Delhi is, uh, you know, uh, uh, about what next, uh, what, uh, what sh uh, to what extent should India go in terms of sensing the developments in Afghanistan and should India wait and watch out. Uh, I think uh, there, is, uh, there, is, there is a sense of like a strategy here in terms of understanding the limits of India's national power that uh, what are the, not only about what India can do, but also understanding what India cannot do. And I think uh, there is indeed a sense that since India had invested so much in its relationship with the Afghan government, there is a feeling that with the Taliban takeover, India does uh, need to sort of step back and see, okay, what can we do with this new uh, political regime uh, with which we don't have a very, very good history. Uh, so it's, it's, indeed there, it, it's indeed there is a Taliban 2.0 with which we can deal. What kind of a Taliban are we seeing? what can we expect from the Taliban's assertion of moderation in terms of seeking legitimacy from the outside world? Can we see rays of hope in terms of dealing with that kind of a Taliban? I think there is too many questions and you know, very, like, very little answers, clear cut answers as to what is really going to happen. I think uh, in New Delhi, people are going to watch out and see um, like, the signals which are coming from the United States in the, because I feel that as far as Talib, Afghanistan is concerned, the US India relationship or the partnership uh, has, hasn't been that clear about the red lines and what we expect from each other uh, from uh, taking a back seat every time we wanted to do more in Afghanistan, especially in security matters when it concerned Pakistan uh, to talking more frankly about what we expect from each other. I think uh, that, you know, as opposed to talking about things, broader things like the Indo-Pacific, when it came to Afghanistan, I think the red lines and the expectations haven't been that clear when it came to India-US relationship. So I think we are watching a lot in terms of, uh, maybe we can talk about this later, the other quad that is being promised, uh, India out and uh, Pakistan in, that's not a very good signal to New Delhi, uh, given the kind of track record that Pakistan has had in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, being an ally on the war on terror and uh, giving safe heavens to 
uh, one of the most violent groups like the Haqqani network in the North Waziristan region. So I think uh, there's a lot of mixed signals which are coming up. Uh, there's a lot of uh, introspection and uh, cautious uh, stepping as far as how New Delhi is going to deal with the evolving situation. Uh, and perhaps when we talk about the refugee situation, I can chip in more in terms of how regional stakeholders are going to have to uh, pick up the slack in terms of how we, how we are going to deal with the refugee out, uh, you know, outpouring. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Manish. Uh, you, you, you kind of unpack a lot of, of uh, ideas there. Uh, uh, turning to the colonels, uh, Colonel Bajinska and, and Colonel Straw, you know, some of the things that, that were brought up that dealt with expectations. Uh, we've also got a, a question uh, over in the, uh, the, about, you know, how much did we really think we were, the, the, uh, the government was going to be able to hold on and how long? Uh, we've seen a lot of reports in, in the, the, the week that, that basically indicated that, you know, uh, while the, the last four administrations had been kind of sugarcoating uh, reality, that there was some under understanding behind the scenes that, you know, maybe the ANA wasn't as strong as what we had hoped that it would be. Um, there's also been indications that, you know, some of the uh, Afghan forces have crossed over into uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and, and elsewhere and, you know, uh, these sorts of things. So can you address some of these topics? You know, what, what how do we build a strategy um, that for the quad, for our, our, for the American role in the quad that, that kind of addresses some of these expectations when we've kind of shown in this particular instance that maybe we're not as reliable as a, as a security guarantor is what we'd like to project ourselves as. And, and how does that affect then our, our relationships with India, with Japan, with Australia, or, you know, quite frankly, if, if we are to pursue this peculiar idea of a, of a Central Asian quad, uh, you know, what, 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 what kind of strategy can we, we pull out of that uh, when the, the, one of the linchpins of, of that, uh, that idea is, is pretty much you know, gone uh, for all intents and purposes? I will, uh, I will speak first if that's okay, Dr. Rockwell. Sure, absolutely. As I, as I look at this situation currently, there's a lot of questions and a lot that is yet to be answered. In the immediate, obviously the concern is the safety of those that are still within Afghanistan. And that there's a lot in the media about disagreement on how to proceed in the future. From a strategy perspective, looking at the aims and interests of all involved. I think part of the concern and part of the question is what is gonna emerge out of the entity that is now in charge in Afghanistan? The, the initial challenge is, are they, gonna, are they gonna step up and adhere to some of the guarantees that they were given? The expectation for the future of Afghanistan is gonna be measured against what the actions of the Taliban were when they were initially in power in 2001. If they are able to provide a semblance of order, if they are able to provide a more inclusive governance that does promise a future that could be less exacting than it was in 2001, I think that would go a long way to reassure many nations that have a closer proximity to that country than the United States does. Our departure from Afghanistan as a military and as a country is not concluded. That chapter hasn't finished being written. I think a very deliberate approach for the way ahead is still evolving on this side as policy and activities and more importantly, directions and intentions are provided to those that are actually on the ground. I would offer at this point, second guessing what's happening on the ground uh, is gonna be fraught with uncertainty and uncertainty is the undoing of most strategies. As far as the velocity with which the Taliban concluded their closure in and around the capital and throughout the country, I would be very 
I, I would have met, I, I would have considered that not to be likely two weeks ago, a month ago. And, and I was surprised with the speed with which they were able to, to reach their ends. So as far as the strategy goes, the aims and interests of all nations I would offer are being examined right now against three possibilities. Is the Taliban disruptive to the region and exporting a level of violence destabling to many of the neighbors? Does the Taliban take control of Afghanistan, exact a, a reign that is not in keeping with the morals that we all as nations hold as the responsibilities of those govern, but they are not exporting those violent ideas? And then lastly, does the dust somewhat settle and there a, a, a government emerges that can be dealt with in the norms that are currently used in the international realm. I, I don't think that's solid. I think a lot of that responsibility lies with how the government comes together that's in Kabul at the time. It's to their advantage to behave in a responsible manner that allows other nations decision space to make decisions on how they're gonna deal with the Taliban as it relates to their own nation's aims and interests. Uh, I am not gonna make a prediction, but I do hold out hope that a better opportunity for the people in Afghanistan will emerge from this than existed in 2001. Over. Colonel Straw, you wanna add anything? I'll briefly add to Bud's comments and I'll address something that you brought up, Dr. Rockwell, as you were talking about the ANA, I think those of us who have uh, been stationed in Afghanistan or have studied Afghanistan, we know that the ANA uh, was not a very strong organization. Unfortunately, it was prim primarily uh, 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 sourced from the north. Uh, most of the problems, of course, were in the east and the south. Very difficult to get people to uh, join the ANA from those or from those areas. When I was in Afghanistan for my second year, I was embedded with the special forces uh, and general. Then Brigadier General Scott Miller was the SIPSOC A commander, and he was working on the Afghan local police uh, uh, as well, which was you know a, a rural effort uh, to get people. Uh, to defend their own villages and to take pride in, in, in securing those areas. Uh, even that was very, very difficult. And so I, I wanna quickly now transition from the tactical, if you will, up to the, the operational and strategic level and say that, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it was, it was tough going back in 2010 and 11 when that program was launched. It was tough to get the ANA uh, to fight. We all know that the Afghan commandos were very proficient and they were very good, but um, that was, it, they, they simply were not enough. How does this relate to the quad you asked and, you know, what do we see in the future? I'm not sure exactly, uh, you know, given what the quads uh, probably focus is and, and uh, as an organization that is uh, sort of uh, interested more in the, in the China and Indo-Pacific area, I'm not sure that this is going to uh, be an area of focus for the quad necessarily would be uh, would be what I would um, uh, surmise is is going to be in the future. So I know you have a lot of folks you want to get to. An Anvesh, why don't you uh, give us a kind of a NATO and, and, and Canadian perspective on this type of thing? How is this? How is the fall of, of Afghanistan and and the rapidity with which it had happened? Uh, how is that playing out? And and you know, kind of what kind of um, spin is being put on it as to, you know, America and its place. Are we a superpower anymore? Those, those, those kinds of things, if, if you would. Well, sure. thank you, Doc, for having me on here. Thank you for uh, my fellow student panelists. And uh, I just want to say to begin with, I think few of us expected to be here so soon, talking about such a grave topic so soon, uh, the fall of the Afghan government, and really just a span of that 10-day offensive, shocking to all of us. Uh, I mean, just to put it in context for our viewers, you're looking at a kid who's, uh, you're looking at me, I'm 21 years old, we're talking about a war that lasted 20 years. That's the amount of time somebody can grow up, write an article about the war, have it published in an academic paper, and be here talking to you about it today. Uh, so it's, it's, it's shocking, kind of the length of time, span, the investment that's been put into this war. 
uh, into nation building, into developing infrastructure and education for Afghans, dams, all these things. So I want to spare a thought for, hopefully if you can, for Afghan women today, for Afghan minorities, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, others, and for all those who fought for justice, for freedom over the past 20 years, whether they were in Afghanistan or if they were from the West, if they were involved in a military di diplomatic capacity, I think a lot of us have been grieving this week. I have friends in Afghanistan and Kabul. Their future is uncertain. So a lot of time, a lot of effort has been expended. And uh, it's, it's, we, we should take a moment and reflect on that. And I think that's the general message. It is one of introspection. So speaking from the Canadian context, we pulled out of Afghanistan. We were there from 2001 to 2014. Last few years from 2011 to 2014 with a training mission. And we've been completely out pretty much since then. We did have uh, Canadians at the, the mission in, in, in Kabul. But uh, in terms of the military capacity, we've been out of that game for a few years now. Our involvement has mostly been through NATO and the multilateral aspect. Uh, in Canada currently, we are in our, in our government's infinite wisdom, we have called an election and we are currently in full campaign season. So there actually hasn't been a lot of the time to dedicate to that uh, kind of strategic discussion that you're seeing in a lot of other places. I was watching a little bit from the British Parliament. I know that they had an emergency session recently. I know that in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi called a national security emergency cabinet meeting. I know in the United States, uh, Biden's had a few press conferences, NATO, Germany, all these places. There have been discussions going on. Unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to do that in Canada. Uh, again, because we called an election the day Kabul fell, it wasn't good optics for the government, unfortunately. Uh, the Prime Minister has been asked a few questions. Prime Minister Trudeau, he's going in for his third re-election campaign at this point. We're coming out of a minority government, uh, so nobody has full control over parliament, and it's very uncertain the polls are fluctuating. But Afghanistan has certainly been an election issue in Canada. All the party leaders have responded and given their thoughts on the subject. Um, both of the major parties, the Conservatives and the Liberals, have uh, outright stated that they will refuse to recognize the Taliban government at this time. I think that makes sense. I think, uh, obviously, in an election campaign, they will say these things, but strategic priorities will change and develop, like uh, Colonel Bajensis again. It'll depend on how much to the extent that which the Taliban has changed, uh, how, how willing they are to reform. And I know that they have reformed tremendously in their internal institutions since 2001. They have become more effective. They have become more lethal. They have a diplomatic and propaganda and information warfare wing. Uh, so they have evolved in a lot of ways. Now it's going to be to the extent that which uh, they're going to apply that evolution to the aspect of governing the country that they have just conquered. I think they will find it much easier to wage a guerrilla war against a foreign invader over 20 years or whatever they've painted it as, uh, versus actually getting down to the very hard work of governing. In Canada, our political discussion, obviously Canada can't, uh, we're not a major superpower like the United States, so we can't go in. We didn't have many unilateral options in terms of what we could do in Afghanistan, even compared to other countries like India and the United States. We weren't able to fly in our own ships and planes and uh, get our people out of there. But uh, the discussion currently is about how many refugees we should be taking. The prime minister has announced 20,000 so far. Uh, and that's a discussion about you know, where they're gonna be allocated. The big thing right now is we've made this announcement and that's wonderful. I think it's important to get the innocent people out of Afghanistan, especially those who helped our militaries over the past many years. There's been many civil society campaigns dedicated to getting them out. But uh, I think it's... Uh, the question now is going to be one of uh, can we can we actually physically get these people out? I mean, we've we've said the prime minister has made this wonderful announcement. But we have no presence in Afghanistan anymore. We don't know how we're going to get these people out or process their visas or get them physically to Canada. So that's going to be the next step. Uh, I think the discussions are going to be ongoing. I think hopefully once the election dust settles, we'll be able to have a strategic discussion about what's happening in Afghanistan. The final point I want to make is about uh, the the United States aspect that you brought up. So. I have been seeing some articles from the commentary class, the foreign policy commentary here, talking about what this means for Canada, what it means for the region, what it means for our relationship with the United States. Uh, there has been um, talk that the United States or Canada has to reinvest in its own military capacities. It has to go out there and make its own path in the world because this doesn't reflect well in the United States. Uh, I think uh, in a lot of ways, we're seeing a continuation of that rhetoric on uh, the past four years, five years from the Trump administration about whether Canada can continue to rely on the United States as its closest ally and partner. There was a lot of hope when Biden uh, came in that this would change, that he would return to some of the more, you know, kind of liberal international instincts, that he would continue to re-engage with the world. But I don't think this is a good look on the Biden administration either. I think this has dashed a lot of Canadian hopes for what we can expect out of the Biden administration, uh, how reliable that partnership is, especially looking at 
you know, if you, if you want to defend democracy from its global retreat or decline over the past few years, this hasn't been a good look. My hope and the hope of, I think, a lot of Canadians is that the United States will step up again, that this will be a, a call for introspection, a wake up call to the Washington strategic community that, you know, it's time to sit down and introspect on what went wrong. Look at our theories of nation building again and how we're going to go about this and how the United States can shore up global democracy because uh, it's been in decline for the past few years. We've seen that. We've seen powers like uh, Russia and China on the rise. They, they, they think that there's a lot more space for autocratic thought and autocratic ways of uh, political organization. I think it's up to the United States now to really sit down and look at, chart out a roadmap for the next few years, see what it's going to do to defend global democracy. Because I do think uh, as much as other countries want to, as much as the Canada or Germany or the United Kingdom might want to save global democracy, from its decline. I think only the United States has that kind of providential power to do so. So this is up to Washington now, and we're, all of us here in Ottawa, we're, we're watching and we're waiting with bated breath. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Amadzai, we, we've kind of held off uh, getting your perspective, but uh, you know, you're, you're coming to us from a completely different background than, than all of these folks. You have been in, in the government of the democratic uh, Afghanistan. You from from here at the vantage point of, of the, the states, you've seen the, you know the 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 effort that you put forth in in, in helping create this um, hopeful instrument for for government in in Afghanistan collapse in, in the last couple of weeks. What's going through your head? What's going through your mind when you as you see this? Where do you see uh, things going? You know, we've got China and and others talking about possibly recognizing the Taliban. Obviously, you know, doing so uh, assures a lock then on on you know taking any uh, UNSC measures against uh, the the Taliban if if they were to misbehave. You know, where, where are we going from here? Are we going to see another uh, Northern Alliance uh, come around and 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 challenge this? Or is this a, a done deal? And, and the best thing that we're going to get is, you know, hopefully a, a kinder, gentler uh, Taliban 2.0. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's very informative to listen to all the different uh, views on what's happening in Afghanistan and how that could present us up with, with challenges and opportunities from leadership perspective. The United States is really taking one, which unfortunately does not look so. I'm going to give you my perspective from a conference that I attended in Tashkent a few weeks ago, where President Ghani and um, Imran Khan exchanged a few interesting words on international stage. What I what I found out, it was an international conference. What I found out, the international community was resigned to the fact that they're not going to wait for the peace talks in Afghanistan for economic activity and the higher interests they have that are above security concerns in that region. Especially the countries around, around Afghanistan. They knew the United States is getting out. It's going to be up to them how to manage regional security, more importantly, regional economic activities. They were resigned to the fact that it doesn't matter if it's the government under President Ghani or the Taliban, as long as their security interests are secure, they can live with them. It doesn't matter what happens there. There was also a naivety that I noticed that they were putting a lot of trust in Taliban. Too much trust, I would say, without knowing what they can offer if they come to the government, which now they have. If the strength of Taliban would not embolden other groups of such mentality, when they claim that we have seen Taliban defeating the United States, the great power in Afghanistan, why can't we do that in our countries? I'm sure there has been chatter in the intelligence community, uh, listening to the chatter in, uh, by the intelligence community that many groups around the world are celebrating Taliban victory in Afghanistan. And that sound is coming higher and louder in Pakistan than anywhere else. When Imran Khan said that why would Taliban negotiate with a government that is ceding ground to them? To me, that clicked very hard and I said, uh oh, which means the peace talks are definitely going to fail. And that's what's happened. 
So I think they made a bet on what Taliban could provide them in the future in the region in terms of economic activities. But the larger threat that could emanate from Afghanistan is how bolstered are the other international extremist groups? When Soviet Union got defeated in Afghanistan, what happened after that was all the Arabs or non-Afghans who were there for jihad went back and formed their own groups in, in their own respective countries. They came back powerful under Osama bin Laden and found a refuge in Afghanistan. Look what happened. It was 9-11 and many other incidents in, in a, everywhere that you could, you could see. And they, most of them were traced back to Pakistan and Afghanistan. I think the history unfortunately repeated itself and we never learned how to engage with tools that could stop the, 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 the savage repetition of history. The withdrawal from Afghanistan, from my perspective, had nothing to do with our American national security interests in Afghanistan or global security. It was a decision made on a pure political vote perspective from the United States. Started with President Trump, continued by President Biden. Both presidents have not hidden their distaste for the so-called war, never ending war, or for what the efforts and, and sacrifice we have made for sustaining peace and security in that region. It's very unfortunate to see that our investment of 20 years of the international community of 20 years goes down the drain in a, in a matter of few hours. Let's, let's also look into the fact that why Afghan army that was propped up by blood and treasure of the United States toppled down in a, few, in a matter of few hours. If we take it back, there are many factors that contribute to that breakdown, starting with the announcement of the deal and negotiating directly with Taliban that undermined the legitimacy of the very government that we, United States and domestic community brought in power with a lot of blood and treasure. I thank our servicemen here for their services for our country, but this was not a failure of our militaries, nor it was a failure of the Afghan military. It was the failure of our leadership in both countries, in Afghanistan and the United States. It was a political failure. It was a lack of will to stand for the values that we have here in the United States, to cherish the values that we have here in the United States of human rights and democracy. I question President Biden's will in a phase where he would be facing world community and telling the world that we fight for democracy when he saw the death of democracy just a few days ago. In that, we have lost the trust of our allies. That's why, Avesh, you talked about Canada thinking of spending more in its military, rethinking if we could trust the United States as an ally. Europeans are thinking of propping popping up their own military why did Taiwan come with a statement recently saying what, what was what was the, the, the what made Taiwan say that we are not going to crumble from within if China attacks us? Because there is a worry because if the United States thinks their their interest is more embedded with working with China, would we sacrifice sacrifice Taiwan? Now that goes around with everyone that called us our allies. United States trust is completely stained. Our strength is questioned. Our will is questioned to stand for human rights, democracy, and the values that we cherish and, exp and help others to, to live by. Afghanistan went down in our history, unfortunately, in a, in a very bad way. And we are troops. I mean, I have been talking with veterans here, and all of them are stressed and question what we did. Was it good? I went, I left something in Afghanistan. I brought something from Afghanistan. It, it hurts when I talk to a veteran and I see tears in their eyes and say, what happened was completely wrong. We could have stopped this. Now there is another calculation that we, we had been making in a wrong perspective is that we thought the solution for Afghanistan would be found, be that military or political, would be found inside Afghanistan. We were completely wrong. Pakistan persuaded us that 
there is no military solution for Afghanistan. We bought that into, but we, they were right. There was a military solution and they proved us wrong. Our strategist is not our failure, it's our political failure. We never went after Al Qaeda in their sanctuaries in Pakistan. And I can tell you the fact that if Afghanistan is not monitored well, if Afghanistan goes back to the dark ages, there could be another incident that we would be regretting that we could have done better than that. So we have wasted what we did in Afghanistan for the last 20 years by a very mere political decision that, you know, naturally we did pull out of Afghanistan. We never consulted our allies, are you gonna pull it or not? They just followed us because we were the big force in the room. They needed our planes, they needed our plans to evacuate. And we said, we get out. And they said, do we have any choice? So when we don't consult our allies, what does, what does that say about us? And what does that say in, in terms of uh, respect for us, or in terms of trust for us? And we are losing that, unfortunately. Now, everybody, the, our, our lack of leadership, unfortunately, is giving space to China, to, to, Iran, to, to Russia, and in the region to Iran. And they know it. We started this isolationism with President Trump and President Biden continued on that path. Everybody was hopeful that President Biden came in of re-engagement and he uh, canceled, uh, he went back to pa Paris back and he was willing to go back to Iran on negotiation. He could, have, he could have gone back with the Afghan government and negotiated directly with them rather than to the Taliban. And we wouldn't have seen this day that we are right now talking about why Afghanistan fell. It's very unfortunate to see that easily that all of us, I'm sure, or majority of us and many other in, in experts in, in, in the world or DC, all the circles advised against what happened and then we could see what was the motive behind that. Just some, some modes. modes. President Biden's popularity is, is, has declined less than 50% first time. And he was banking on that popularity. I'm not sure if he's gonna be another one-term president like President Trump. That is a very big poss possibility. Republicans are already investing in that fact. Actually, they already issued ads that Afghanistan has become a major policy, international policy failure for President Biden. So for us, the question is, are we going to go and continue with the same policies of let, letting allies lose trust in us? Next time, God forbid, if it's a, such an incident, someone else that threatens us or directly, indirectly, and we need our assistance from our allies, what do we expect from more allies? Are they going to stand with us or somebody else? I'm sorry I'm getting a bit um, into, into detail of this one because I have seen this first and it has affected me personally in my work and in my life because I was born in Afghanistan and a proud Afghan American. And I don't like my country, United States of America, being perceived by our own choice, which is which is not a good choice that we have made. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Imadza. Uh, I definitely appreciate the the, uh, the perspective, and, and you open up a, a lot of uh, issues that, that I think we should address. Uh, moving forward, now that everybody's had a chance to to kind of lay out their their own perspective uh, in some detail and everything, let's try to keep the the, the answers to a, a, a little more manageable time span so that everybody gets a chance to to uh, participate again and so that we can get some, to some of the questions from uh, the participants as well or the uh, the audience as well. Um, one of the things that that you brought up, Mr. Madzai, is, is the, the, the nature of how we lost political versus military. And this seems to be a recurring theme in you know, post-World War II America. Uh, you know, we didn't out win Korea necessarily. We didn't win Vietnam. And here we are again in, in a situation where politics uh, seem to be trumping uh, the military. Um, what do we do to, to, to resolve that? What, what do we do to, to you know, turn the, 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 the tide on that? And, and you know, one of the issues I brought up earlier and that, that Mr. Imadzai touched on as well is how does pulling out in this fashion, not necessarily pulling out uh, specifically, but pulling out in this fashion, how does that damage the U.S. brand as a security guarantor with our allies? Uh, and, and I'm not talking European allies necessarily. They pulled out as well. But, uh, you know, if we're going to be the the the, the the biggest voice in the quad, and I'm talking about the original quad when, when, I, when I talk about this, or, or, we, or we try to sell the idea of the quad to, into a quad plus, 
what does it say for us as a security guarantor if we're going to continue to allow election year politics or you know politics in general to dictate um, you know the way that we that, that we fight? Are we fighting to win? Or are we just fighting for for photo ops? Or what what is what is it? Um, uh, I'll turn this over to the the, the colonels first, uh, if you will, okay, kind of addressing you know, what what can we do from the military perspective to to, to try to turn that that around. Uh, and, and to try to prop up our uh, reputation amongst our, our would-be allies in the region as well. Dr. Wackwell, I'll take a... Sorry, I inadvertently muted you. <clears throat> well, uh, I understand. So as I was gonna say, the United States military is subordinate to policy. That's a bedrock of our existence. The civ-mil relationship is very clear and actually very well understood on the, the military side. So the policy that is established operates within the tensions that a theorist Clausewitz, and we're all familiar with his trinity. And the policy guidance is measured against the temperament of the civilian population and, and the temperaments of our nation to ramp up and get further engaged and deeper involved in a commitment along the lines of Afghanistan was clearly communicated through a series of interactions with our government to be less than appetizing. I would be reluctant as a professional serviceman to believe that I know better than the civil elected officials of our nation. I think that's one of the strengths of our system. Our responsibility with regard to strategy is to ensure that we provide the means and the ways that are necessary to underpin the aims and interests contained within a larger strategic framework for our nation. I, I, I do wanna say that this is not something that I take cavalierly as a professional. So I'm trying to maintain my perspective that we operate within the framework of our system. And we would have to ask very clearly what the expectation is as our nations consider, as our nation considers the application of the instrument of military power, hopefully in concert with other elements of national power that can carry a more whole of government approach. I can't speak to how other elements within the United States government would also be re-examining how we move forward. But from a military perspective, our necessity is to apply our skill within the framework of the policy established. And if that's to be an exporter of security, then it's our responsibility to be the anchor that provides that. So as Afghanistan continues to unfold, my responsibility is to educate our students in how to articulate our capabilities and the capabilities we need to continue to gain to underpin the strength of this nation. The credibility of our nation, um, Mercer wrote that the credibility is actually owned by the other players in the arena. Um, we have to move forward we have to continue to cling to our values. I, I would offer that it is simple to cling to your values when things are going well. It's when you're challenged. It's when you suffer a setback that leadership truly begins to emerge. So my responsibility is to continue to remember my place within the order of our nation and to underpin what I believe the linchpin values that we stand for are within this country in our dealings in the future. There are other players that don't adhere to those values, which offers them some concerns that they don't have to take to heart. And, and that while a strength is our system can afford opportunity to less inclined behavior, behaviors within the international realm. Um, that, that's it. I'm trying to keep the answer short. I failed. I'm sorry, Colonel Straw. 
Let me just uh, start off by acknowledging Mr. Ahmadzai's uh, comment about the military and those who have served and the thanks that he extended. Uh, nevertheless, I do believe that this will be something that like Vietnam will be studied for a long time within the military and that there, you know, you can't, the, the political aspects are certainly going to be studied as well. But I think that there is some culpability that needs to be extended uh, as well to the US military. And uh, if you look at Chris Pocock from the United Kingdom, he has a, uh, a an example of that debate that is already breaking out, if you will, from uh, an article that General Deptula uh, sent out uh, or, or some comments that he has made. And that that type of, those types of questions need to be asked and we need to examine uh, what we did. Uh, I'm really glad to hear Brud bring up um, uh, civil military relations as well. I think that that is an important area. And I would say that it's not quite as settled as Bud uh, would, would uh, perhaps as, as he thinks, uh, you know, whether you're, you're, you're Samuel Huntington or you are Elliot Cohen or your HR McMaster, uh, this is going to drive an analysis of sub-mill relations as well that should be debated within the war colleges. And I think that that uh, will be an important aspect and, and this will serve as a case study in the very new, near future. Over. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so uh, turning to that, Idea that you know we're, that uh, in the Quad, especially and in, in, in Taiwan and other places in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we are seen as a, a security guarantor, and, and uh, China is seen as as our rival in, in that um, that particular uh, role. Uh, I still I would like to hear from you, Manish, if you would to, to start us off. How how does this impact our, our ability to to sell ourselves as a as a security guarantor? Uh, to the, the, the nations that we're interested in working with in the region uh, and, and, and wean some of the others away from, uh, from, from China. For example, you know, we're, we're both vying for uh, influence within ASEAN. Uh, we, we have, you know, Pacific Island nations that are, are, are dropping off uh, the recognition from tai for Taiwan and, and giving it to Beijing instead. Uh, you know, is this going to, this seeming weakness on, on our part, and again, I'm just talking, talking optics here, uh, does that send a, a bad signal to our would-be uh, partners and allies in the region? And you know, what can we do in terms of strategic messaging maybe to, to remedy some of that? Uh, thank you, Ernest. Um, uh, first of all, before jumping into that, I, uh, you know, I absolutely concur with the uh, two military officers uh, that this is going to be one of the most significant case studies uh, of civil mill relations. And uh, this is something that we study in India as well, you know, the civil mill relations of uh, political leadership and uh, military, uh, military, uh, you know, uh, military missions and uh, uh, objectives. Um, I think, you know, coming to the point of what and the question of reliability, um, you know, taking it a broader sense, I think, you know, it's not the first time that the United States has gone into this political, military overstretch uh, debate about the question of uh, if, if we have to do more at home, do we necessarily need to do less abroad? You know, uh, that, 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 uh, the, uh, is there a dichotomy between the two in the sense that uh, if we look at, even from the point of optics, I'm still trying to understand what Biden's administration foreign policy for the middle class really translates to, right? So, you know, that's why I think two days back, I began writing a article where I questioned that has uh, Afghanistan paid the price for Biden's foreign policy for the American middle class, you know? So I, uh, and talking about political um, uh, seesaws uh, that um, uh, Shehjan mentioned, I think uh, even before the presidential elections come, uh, we have a congressional elections happening next uh, next year. Uh, and I would really want to see how uh, the politicians uh, from both the parties are going to use this uh, pullout from Afghanistan, uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, for the congressional elections coming up. Um, regarding the Quad, again, uh, coming more to the point, I, I, I guess we need to separate uh, the question of uh, reliability and America being the security guarantor uh, from what the objective right now for the Quad really is and whether uh, what has happened in Afghanistan 
and the optics that comes out of Afghanistan uh, has a uh, has a immediate direct impact on uh, the uh, you know the question of uh, reliability of the United States as a security guarantor vis-a-vis Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific, right? Whether it's the Taiwan Straits or whether it's in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. Uh, of course, even in the case of uh, Chinese aggression at the India-China border, uh, 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 in terms of at least debates in the strategic community, these things have always come up that uh, when America talks about Indo-Pacific, does it only talk about the maritime belly of the Indo-Pacific and what happens when there are continental aggressions which happens in the Indo-Pacific? Does America give enough focus on the continental aggressions? I think, uh, you know, so that, 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 that sense of like what to expect from the United States, uh, both in terms of optics and substance, when it, when it comes to uh, like local Chinese aggressions, uh, whether it's the India-China border or whether it is uh, in the littorals of the Indian Ocean. That question is always there. And I think uh, we are always at the mercy of, to some extent, the kind of foreign policy debate of retraction and extension that happens within the United States. You know, I think it's not new in the sense that this whole idea of nation building at home and frugal superpower, frugality of superpower really happens post the financial crisis in 2008, which is carried over by the Obama administration, somehow carries over, uh, uh, although uh, Trump administration is quite different, but the undercurrents of doing less abroad in order to do more at home is carried over through administrations. And I think we need to really look at, in order to question, uh, uh, get into the idea of, uh, reliability and security guarantor that uh, if you if we look at right across from the 2015 military strategy of the United States uh, there you know you have a sense of like the American uh, uh, multi-service NMS joint state of staff sort of talking of the violent extremist organizations and building some kind of a graph of hybrid conflict and state conflict and non-state conflict but the, the moment you move into the NNS of the Trump administration and the NDS and the NMS, unclassified portions of the NMS of 2008, there is a distinct shift from talking about uh, uh, threats from non-state actors to talking about interstate uh, strategic competition. So I think uh, uh, when we talk about alliance commitments, uh, either with the NATO or the European allies and also with the Indo-Pacific allies in Asia. Uh, I think we need to do a, the, the, draw a little bit of a distinction between uh, what the optics of what has really happened in the last 10 days or so in Afghanistan, whether it is going to have a direct implication and an impact of uh, the Indo-Pacific partners really losing uh, trust in America or do we need to see differently where all these countries, which are also concerned about Chinese aggression, they're thinking from what happens in Afghanistan to what they are looking forward as a threat from China. And last but not the least, you know, we are talking a lot about China and Russia right now in Afghanistan. I think in the short term, it looks like a total failure for America in optics and a total win for China and vis-a-vis -vis Russia of filling the security vacuum and getting more out of Afghanistan. I think the picture could be quite different in the medium and the long term. I think the Chinese are in for a test of the same, uh, you know, grind that South Asian geopolitics or Southern Asian geopolitics has to offer them. If the Chinese have been pushing this idea that why not consider China as a crisis manager in South Asia, now is the time. Let the Chinese come and see if they can be a uh, broker of uh, crisis and uh, management in South Asia. Let's see it. I mean, that, that those are my points. Thank you. Back to the graveyard of empires, right? Okay, so let's change gears a little bit here. And Andres, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, I know this is something that's a, that you had brought up earlier uh, to some extent. Uh, with a likely massive number of Afghans seeking refuge in the West and elsewhere, uh, what sort of reception can these displaced persons expect in Europe, South Asia, Canada, and the United States and other countries around the world, particularly given the fatigue that some communities have expressed in the aftermath of similar migration associated with wars and economics in the Middle East? Yeah, I think it's a good question, and I think it's a good reflection of this idea that uh, 
you cannot disengage from the world. And this is something I want to say, especially to Americans who think that, uh, oh, maybe if we get out of these foreign entanglements and our life is going to be easier, we'll be able to fix our, our country and do this and that. But the reality is that what happens over there, it affects us over here. I know we don't always get that sense of being on our little North American continental bubble, but the fact of the matter is if the Afghan government had maintained its stability, then we wouldn't have had this influx of refugees of people trying to get out, people who are trying to escape Taliban rule. So stability at abroad promotes and enhances stability and security at home. And that's an integral lesson. And I hope it's one that uh, not just the American political class, but regular Americans can, can digest and understand. Regar uh, regarding the actual um, refugees themselves, I think the Europeans are going to be very, very annoyed at what's going to happen because they've already been facing this influx of refugees over the past many years. They've done a lot of work in trying to integrate these communities, but it's, it's, it's a lot. It's going to be a lot and it's it's going to add to the annoyances with what happened with the American withdrawal in Afghanistan with the failure to communicate and consult with partners and now the burden that they're going to have to take in terms of placing these refugees. As, as for my views uh, personally, I, I'm very happy that we're taking 20,000 refugees in Canada. I've uh, met Afghan refugees last summer. I was walking around the park and I met a security can contractor who was Afghan. He settled down. He had a little four or five year old daughter. She was very cute. And I was just very happy that she was here and she had the chance to play in a, in a regular playground, that she had a chance to grow up, get an education and live a regular Canadian life. I was really glad to see that. And I think a lot more Afghans deserve that. I think they don't deserve what's happened to them now. And I, I think if, look, if they're trying to escape and they're trying to get over here, it means they don't agree with what's happening with the Taliban. It means they probably helped a lot of, a lot of Afghans helped the Western military operations that were happening there. And we don't leave our allies behind. We don't leave people who work for us, who are critical to the operations there. We shouldn't leave them behind. That's a moral issue. That's a moral failing, rather. So I think a lot of people in civil society has been lead leading the charge of this. This has not been governments who have been doing a great uh, deal of work on this. Uh, the American government, one of the big critiques of the Biden administration is, well, what if, look, if you're going to leave the country, at least look at how you're wrapping up your operations there. Look at how you're getting people out. Why wasn't there a better pipeline for getting these people back to the United States. This is a question that the Canadian government is facing now. Sure, we could announce these things the day after Kabul falls, but what's your plan of getting these people actually out of there when the Taliban is knocking door to door and trying to find out who worked with the Americans or the Canadians or the Western militaries? These people are in very real and pressing danger. So uh, I, I think it's a, if they're trying to get over here, they're uh, probably people who supported freedom, who supported liberty, supported the Western military operations there. There are people who do not ideologically agree with what's happening with the Taliban takeover, and there are people who probably just want a better life. So I think it's going to it's going to be tough for uh, for the Europeans, for the Americans to to do this kind of burden sharing. But it's a result of the catastrophic consequences of what happened in Kabul last weekend. Thank you, Andesh. And uh, now let's, uh, Mr. Madzai, this this question is for you. And it, I, I'm trying to incorporate some of the stuff that's going on in, in the, the chat box over here, too, uh, with 200 uh, folks participating at any given time. It's, it's kind of difficult to keep up with all of the comments, but uh, I'll, I'll try to address at least the topics that are, are being expressed there, if not necessarily the, the, the questions themselves. So with various actors, including China, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, eager to fill the, the power vacuum left by the U.S. withdrawal, what does the future hold for Afghanistan under Taliban control? Should we expect a subsequent exporting of Taliban ideology and influence throughout the region akin to what we witnessed uh, in the aftermath of the 1979 Iranian Revolution? Or is it going to be something that's confined more narrowly uh, to perhaps the stands, uh, you know, Afghanistan itself, Pakistan, Tajikistan, and, and others that are, are neighboring countries? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to first comment on something else. Uh, uh, Manish said that um, there is, is possible mentality that let China solve the problem of Afghanistan uh, or uh, probably Re Russia solve the problem of Afghanistan. Well, that probably would say a lot about our, about our values. We're not talking about a toy that I broke down, couldn't fix it, gave it to somebody else now. Give it a try because you think genius, you're more genius than I am. We're talking about human lives here. That, talks, that, that, that should say a lot about the the human rights that we were trying to defend. Uh, that's why we have this influx and exodus from, from Kabul airport, tens and thousands of people are getting out, you know, uh, all these things. I mean, President Biden says that China solve it because they have been free riders of, of, of sort or, or whatever we call them. But 
I mean, I question that uh, that belief that it's it's a toy that you give it to, to the Chinese and the Russians, to Pakistanis, to the Russians, fix it now because we couldn't, we broke it, we couldn't fix it. That that says a lot about. And unfortunately, uh, I totally disagree with that thought because we're talking about human life. Coming back to what could happen um, when Taliban could be whatever shape, I think that's a that's a big test for Taliban to be uh, what they can be or they cannot be. Let me tell you something, the, the, the vacuum created by United States cannot be filled by China, Russia, or any other country in that part of the world. None. We are the largest and the strongest nation on this earth. We spend trillions of dollars. Nobody could match our expense there. Nobody could match our military fight there, uh, strength there. So that is for fact. Um, if we expect the Taliban be whatever they want, be exporting their ideology or emboldening others that already started. Uh, extremist groups already started celebrating its victory over us. Now, how, how could Taliban rule in Afghanistan? There, there, there are two different scenarios, scenarios that I can think of. Either they become a stable country, a stable a partner with an inclusive government uh, that could bring together uh, and help Afghans say, preserve all the values that they have. Uh, maybe not all, partially some, because it looks to be another security state coming into, into formation. Uh, because I just heard a report that Kabul city uh, security has been given to Haqqani network. Imagine that. I'm not gonna go into details what it is. Um, my military colleagues know them better than I do in terms of technical stuff. But um, how, how Afghanistan would turn into, because first of all, Taliban have only been able to fight rather than to govern, they're gonna be having tough time. And they already started having tough time how to govern people because there have been demonstrations. Uh, Afghanistan would starve because we're not gonna give them money, the money that we're holding here in terms of aid because it has been dependent country on aid for, for decades. Uh, for the last 50 years, it has received aid from international community for the neighbors. And the generation of Afghans that was brought up and born in the last 20 years is a different Afghanistan. There will be clashes between civilians, the Afghans and the government, which is in power right now. Taliban would either go and accept the international and local pressure, be a sensible governor and responsible government, or go back to authoritarian regime and take Afghanistan back to the darkness. These are two, two big choices they have to make. And at the same time, let's not forget that the country that we called our ally uh, had been practically fighting us in Afghanistan, and that was Pakistan. We always forget that out of the equation here. We talked about Afghanistan, we limited the boundaries of Afghanistan. You know what? What Prime Minister of Pakistan said that Afghans have finally broken the shackles of slavery. Well, that's a huge statement. Our ally is calling us occupiers, the ally that we give $15 billion to, and they use that against us. It was the Pakistani General Hamid Gul, which said, history will write this, that ISI beat United States with its own money. So there are, there are huge statements that they're very factual and that, that they've been celebrating that. So what we are, and these things are, are dangerous for us unless they are controlled because that's gonna embolden many extremists who could say that we could do this in Afghanistan, why not in other places? So there are different scenarios that new leadership in Afghanistan will be in charge with. Uh, what to do with Afghanistan? Are you gonna be another stable country, another player in the international arena, or are they gonna go back to, to authoritarian, authoritarian regime, dictatorial style of governance and be what they were in 1992? I think there will be a, a defiance in the Afghan, among, from the Afghan public, which has already started. And there will be uh, very much resistance from the Afghan public. And that's because we should be proud of the fact that we have distilled some values that we cherish here among the new generation of Afghans. And they really love those values and they know how valuable these things are for them. Thank you, sir. Uh, so my, my last of my prepackaged questions here will go to the colonels and, and to you too, Mr. Ahmadzai. Uh, so finally, uh, Colonel Straw and, and Bajitska, both of you deployed to Afghanistan multiple times. And Mr. Ahmadzai, you devoted a significant amount of your career to helping to build a, a democratic Afghanistan. Given your firsthand experiences, what lessons learned 
should the United States and its allies understand from these 20 years, and I would say 20 plus years, given you know, our involvement uh, with, with training uh, folks there you know, while the, the Soviets were there, what, what from these years, should, what are the lessons learned that we should take from the, these years in Afghanistan? Am I going since first? I've jumped since I've jumped in first the last two times, I'm going to ask Colonel Straw to take the lead on this one. Over, Mr. Ahmad Zai, looks like you're ready to go. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Well, the lessons learned that we have, I don't know how many times we have to repeat a chapter to to lesson, learn new lessons because this is not something new. This is something we have been seeing in our histories many times. Vietnam was one. Uh, Korea was, you know, relative success. We have, we have been there. We have been in Europe for the last 75 years. We have been in Korea for the last 75 years. We have been in the Middle East. I don't know for what. All those countries are stable. And we know there is instability in Afghanistan. We pulled out of forces. I don't know which chapter we have to, of the history we need to learn lessons from. It's going to continue, unfortunately. But we have to first learn the lesson. How often should we, be, should we, be, should we let history repeat itself? I'll piggyback, on, take. I'll piggyback you. on your comments as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that the, the thing that uh, when you study counterinsurgency, one of the things that is absolutely essential for success is a, uh, a neighboring country that uh, has the ability to provide uh, resources, sanctuary, et cetera. And Pakistan has been mentioned many times during this discussion. And I think that the, the if you go all the way back to 2006, when a, a reemergent uh, Taliban uh, uh, came after spending you know, years uh, of sanctuary in Pakistan, it's received the support that it's needed. Uh, and when you look at the conditions that, uh, that we were trying to fight uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda in, uh, it, it, they, they were simply were not favoring uh, success. I think it's a lesson that has been learned many, many times in the past and it will be relearned again. That's not learning. That's a lack of learning. I'm going to be really just straight, straightforward with you guys. I don't blame the military. I blame a lack of planning in our civilian side and a lack of willingness to learn lessons. All right. We can Fine. Do you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Sir, okay. we're going to finish the questions at hand and then we'll turn it over to the audience questions in a moment. Colonel Bajinska? Yes, sir. Um, the, there are a great deal of lessons, uh, as, as a, as, as I learn just as much as I prepare to teach the students over here in this department. One of the, one of the articles we read is by, or books we read is by a gentleman named Lutbag who, who makes claims about what's necessary to be successful for an insurgency a counterinsurgency and and is the necessity that is required something that a democracy can provide it, it's a cautionary warning against the exacting cost that entering into an endeavor such as that uh could yield and and in essence there's two lessons there the cost against the the citizens who are asked to participate in that endeavor that could ultimately not be successful. And then the inverse cost to the, to the morals and the framework of the nation that's, that's could be necessary if it is successful. Are you still able to look at yourself in the face in the mirror if you are able to do what may be required? Uh, as we move forward and we look at these, you know, as an American, in my lifetime, this is the third time firsthand that I've watched our nation be called to task by the international arena. The first one, of course, was in 75, 
my my older brother participated and I watched his face as those events unfolded. In 1979, while not a military endeavor, that was something that that called into question the validity of some of the things we were attempting to do as a nation. And then now I'm watching these events unfold. I remember sitting in Afghanistan in 2014, watching what was happening in Syria and in Iraq. And I watched some of my brethren who had who had served in those areas and, and how that that took to them. You know, I remember at the end of the Gulf War in 1991, when President George H.W. Bush made the comment that we finally thrown off uh, the lessons of Vietnam. So I think there's an awful lot to learn. One of the things that the United States military does is examine all activities, whether successful or failures. I think it's going to take a long time for us to absorb what's happened. I, I don't think that this is complete. I think that the historians that are in elementary school now are the ones that are going to provide the scholarship that will ultimately evaluate in terms the events that we're watching today and over the last 20 years. As an individual, the way I correct myself and the way I learn is I, I exercise the freedoms I'm given in this country in a responsible manner that allows me to set the example for others day to day wearing this uniform. I'm not taking it off. I'm not going to resign. I believe that we have an important responsibility. And I, I alluded to this earlier. The responsibilities are easy to share and easy to hold when everything is going great. It's when things call into question and there are human lives in the balance over this. There's a responsibility to those that have enabled our successes or failures, but our endeavors there that has yet to be yet to be paid in full. As I watch the efforts to, to, to extract those that are needing to be brought to safety unfold, I, I think that this is going to be a, a, a time of self-reflection. And, and I'm not going to be so arrogant as to say, okay, now we've got it figured out. Um, in, in this is not my idea, but in warfare, you know, everything is complicated, even the simplest things. Uh, so as a professional, my responsibility at this point is to take a hard look and to try to make honest assessments as we move forward to, to strengthen what we need to have ready so that if the call does come again, because the one thing I can guarantee you is the call is going to come faster than we think it is for whatever happens in the future. Um, and since I sense that this is about to be open to Q&A, uh, Dr. Rockwell, thank you for asking me to participate. And I apologize that I'm probably one of the least educated members of your panel, but thank you for suffering through my thoughts, sir. Over to you. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody. And you know, education is a is a great thing, but it doesn't trump experience. Uh, and and uh, having uh, been on both sides of that camp, I, I can say that I, I value both uh, both perspectives equally. Um, you know, we, we are running up against time here. We've got about ten minutes left uh, maximum. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to uh, kind of wrap things up. And there's a lot of Q and uh, questions that we didn't get to. But here's what I'm going to say is this is obviously a question or a, a conversation that needs to continue. And the, the journal is publishing uh, articles right now, uh, very short articles, 700 to 1500 words. We're trying to crank at least one out a day. Um, that being the case, you know, if you have a, a, a pressing uh, issue that you want to, to drive home and everything, I encourage you to write, uh, write about it and send it to us and, and we'll get it out there. These are all commentaries. And so that they're not having to go through the same rigorous uh, treatment that, that their longer articles have to go through. And they're being published in digital only format. So we're getting them out there pretty quick. And I know that some of you that, that are in attendance today have some very uh, strong opinions that you would like to share. And so I encourage you to do that instead of uh, trying to squeeze in a, a, a boatload of questions in the limited time that we have here. I want to thank all of our panelists again uh, for, for all of the uh, great insight that you provided for us. 
Uh, we're going to put this out on our YouTube page as a, as a recording. We're also going to uh, take extract the audio and put it out there as, as uh, a part of our Indo-Pacific Affairs podcast. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the consortium of Indo-Pacific researchers is is designed to to tackle some of these issues. We have in-house writing, in-house um, editing, and, and research that, that we're pouring into this. Some of which will be published in the journal some of which will be published on the consortium's website and other articles that will be published uh, in different fora uh, throughout the region. And so I encourage all of you to also engage then with members of the consortium and, and uh, you know, bounce ideas off of them, uh, maybe pair up with them. If, if you're not into writing yourself, uh, maybe you can just pair up with one of them who's into writing uh, and, and you can get your, your ideas down on paper together. Um, you know, as I said, this is not a, a, an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. I foresee us having many more sessions uh, on this topic. We will take the questions that we didn't get to tackle today uh, from the chat box and, and try to work those into our, our follow on uh, discussion sessions. And, uh, you know, I very much appreciate the, the, the turnout that we had today. And, and obviously, you know, the numbers have stayed up pretty high throughout the entire thing. So, uh, it seems that uh, our panelists have done a fantastic job, and I, I appreciate that very much. And uh, I, I think then with, with that, uh, I'm just going to thank the audience for being here, thank the panelists for being here, and uh, we'll, we'll see you all again uh, very soon. And if you have any questions or concerns, you know, feel free to drop me an email. I'm not hard to find. And uh, thank you, and have a great day, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. If anybody wants to hang around a little bit, I'll, I'll be here so you can, you, can, you can yap at me. Yeah, thank you so much for this meeting. Um, I'm sure people share a lot of their experience. I'm a freelance journalist, Army freelance journalist, and we're still covering Afghanistan uh, reports. Just now we got a confirmation. The Taliban find out the two of Af American allies by biometric system, they, they fingerprint their fingers and they arrested. At each minute I'm receiving a report, they are torturing and they are haunting our allies. I hope this meeting will be effective in President Administration Office. I'm in the United States, it's a full night I didn't sleep. I'm covering all reports. What's going on over there? Thank you so much. Thank you, and you try to get some of those reports into us, and we'll see if we can get them out there for you. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Good night from India. Thank you, Monish. Take care. <laughs> and and uh, I, I sent your journal, your article back to you, so you should be uh, uh, able yeah. to get those edits taken care of. And or, no, wait, I already typeset it, didn't I? Forget it. <laughs> okay. Everything's all right. getting all crammed in my head. Right. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks. Good night, Amnesh. Good night, Colonel uh, Good, night. Good night, sir. Have a pleasant evening. If you have time for one question before you close, um, I'm Charlie Thank Carpenter. You, sir. I Thank teach. you. Have a good day. Yes, ma'am. I'm Charlie Carpenter. I teach uh, international affairs at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. One of the best articles I've read in your journal was written by Major Ryan Wee from West Point. Last November, it was published. He was arguing at that time that a peacekeeping mission, UN peacekeeping mission, could be a useful um, way, thing to phase in as the US phased out of Afghanistan. Of course, nothing came of that, not, not yet. But I was curious to know what the thinking in this group might be on the potential for some kind of uh, United Nations force, not necessarily an intervention force on either on behalf of either side, but a, but a peacekeeping force to sort of observe or help enforce some kind of peace between the various sides that are sort of devolving in the situation. Is, is there has there been thoughts about that, or are there thoughts about the potential for that at this point? Anybody out there want to tackle that? Um. I'll give it a try, Dr. Rockwell. Ma'am, the, the idea of a UN force of any type going into uh, that nation, 
I, I believe that the diplomatic efforts to arrive to a resolution that would underpin any efforts of that magnitude have yet to be discussed. In fact, I think one of the challenges that a representative from the UN made yesterday was coming to a determination on who exactly it is that re represents in the diplomatic forum uh, the Taliban that are there currently. I, I would offer that one of the things I've noticed in my study preparations and experience is outside organizations don't tend to fare very well operating inside Afghanistan. So there's going to be, I would offer some hesitancy and some military assessments and some diplomatic assessments that would need to be solidified before before that could take place. And I offer that with the current uncertainty unfolding on the ground, that there is a lot of information yet to come. Uh, the individual who made some comments about what his sources are saying uh, is gonna be a lot of the uncertainty that would influence any United Nations level uh, discussions and, and actions that would underpin some sort of military force to guarantee a peace that I would offer doesn't exist right now. Uh, I would be hesitant to enter into anything along those lines without more of a diplomatic consensus from the UN body. And, and I think that it's, we, we may be some time away from being able to have unemotional and effective discussions that would entertain a course of action as you propose. Uh, is that at all what you meant by your question, over? Certainly, thank you. That's very insightful. I would definitely agree. This is more of a forward-looking idea, not something that we're ready for this week. Um, it just seemed to me that there was initially a narrative that the Taliban had won, but it seems to me that we may be on the brink instead of just a renewed civil war where the sides have switched. And in that case, and with the US pulling out, it seemed to me that there might be an opening shortly for the United Nations to take a more, a stronger and more neutral role in brokering and assisting to monitor a peace. But I was curious um, how little of that seemed to be part of the conversation. I was, I was curious if that might be changing. I, I agree with you. It's, um, I'm sort of thinking ahead then. And I just wanna say also, this has been a terrific conversation. I really appreciated the opportunity to listen in and learn the many different dimensions of this situation. So thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. And, and, and I would echo uh, Colonel Bojenska, you know, that one of the other problems would be, you know, who's gonna supply the troops if we were to send in a UN peacekeeping mission. And, and I think, you know, given the optics that we've seen in the aftermath of, of the Taliban taking Kabul, it's gonna be a very hard sell to get anybody to, to cough up the troops to, to, to uh, provide the force for that sort of thing. Yeah, but but I would like to say that uh, Doc uh, that for the peacekeeping operations like uh, the regional players like India, like it has a, it has a great history in the sending the peacekeeping troops, and then the, it won't be the contested uh, like in in the face of China or in, on uh, on other on other uh, enemies uh, countries like like India has enmity with China, but when India is sending the peacekeeping operations under the UN umbrella. Then it will be it will be best chance for India to participate in all those activities. And it would it certainly give India an opportunity to protect the investment that it made in in Afghanistan under our watch as well. So I mean that that would make some sense from an economic perspective. I just don't know whether you know we, with China giving you such a headache in in Ladakh and elsewhere. I'm not sure that the that the, the Modi administration is going to want to send any sizable force into Afghanistan. Um, I guess it's 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 a it's, it's a matter of uh, of algebra there as to you know whether or not those troops will help. Uh... Yeah, I think I think another important thing to remember is that uh, we we often talk about these populations or insurgent groups as if we have the unilateral unilateral ability to act on them, but Afghans have agency of their own. The Taliban has an agency and it has a mind of its own. I mean, uh, even the Taliban speaking of it as a centralized organization would not be totally correct, and I think. The challenges of actually governing Afghanistan and having their uh, infrastructure set up, we're going to see how well they're able to maintain that unity now that a foreign threat is gone. 
uh, they, they could very well splinter. We're already seeing kind of a calls to re resurrect the Northern Alliance out in Panjshir. So I think um, if you're, if you're going to talk about a United Nations mission in Afghanistan, you're going to have to see if the Taliban's okay with another foreign force stepping on, uh, on Afghan soil. And as for India, I, I don't think that would, uh, I think India is very carefully looking at the situation now, especially its own security interests in Kashmir. And I think rocking the boat with the Taliban by sending any, anybody on the ground, that would be a, a severe strategic mistake for any Indian administration. I think it's better dealt with on a bilateral basis behind the scenes of the Taliban. Not to, to, mention, the, not to mention the Pakistani reaction to Indian boots on the ground. Absolutely. Dr. Lockwood? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for a great uh, uh, roundtable discussion. This is fantastic. Uh, it's a timely, uh, important, uh, a topic to talk about it. I'm a, uh, a professor at Alabama State University. I'm teaching geography. So uh, yes, we have listened so many wonderful backgrounds and information and data and experiences. The past uh, several uh, events uh, coming from uh, Vietnam, Iraq, and all those other places, and plus uh, currently we are going through Afghanistan. The one thing that we need to understand the lesson learned from the past. How do we go forward? If we believe that we can make a change, a positive change as a global leader, we need to find a different path. Because that's the lesson we learned and how much we spend in this particular war, $2 trillion. Can we think about we could have done something differently? Did we achieve, before we head into any particular task, we need to identify what are the goals that we're going to achieve, the long-term goals. How are we going to achieve that goals? Are we going to stay for infinity years or are we going to get out from the place? Because those places are belongs to people. So we need to identify our goals and what is the right time to get out? So without those kind of a strategic planning, we should not get into the places because these are regional issues. The regional players, they need to take care of the regional problems. We cannot be the international police people. So the regional partners, regional people, they need to take care of, they need to clean up the situation. So what I'm saying here, I don't know this is the right path for, for us to go. I think we need to invent and find out another approach like Peace Corps. Because we have over 3,000 universities in this country. We have so many wonderful scholars. We need to use the minds of our trained scholars, how we can be the leader once again to make a positive change on human rights, the freedom, the female, the women's right in Afghanistan or any other places, how we can use our scholars to go and do the right thing. If you think about the lesson what we learned from the military approach, can we do differently something else? That also a very important point that I want to make it to this uh, forum. Thank you, sir. Right. And Dr. Alagan, thank you very much. Uh, you know, just real quick, you know, if my panelists are still on, you don't have to stick around. We're in overtime. So I understand you've got uh, other commitments. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and stick around. I'm off today. So <laughs> no big deal. Uh, uh, so to, to, to answer your question, you know, we, we did try to do some of that sort of thing. Uh, we stood up the human terrain system, you know, back in the early days of, of both the, the conflict in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. It didn't work out very well. Uh, part of that was uh, due to the, the types of scholars that we hired. Uh, some of them were, were scholars, others were pseudo scholars. Um, and it, it putting um, civilians into a military setting is not always optimal. And uh, I think that the, uh, the, the downfall of the human terrain system pretty much proved that uh, to be the case. Um, it's one thing to understand a culture, you know, in, in, in terms of understanding its language and in terms of, um, you know, ivory, ivory tower sort of learning. 
It's another thing to understand it uh, from a more operational perspective or from an indigenous perspective. And I think that's a lot of what we run into uh, when uh, we were trying to understand, you know, what is it that makes the Afghan culture tick and what can we do differently uh, to, 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 to fix things uh, there, you know, both from a military perspective and also from, you know, trying to stand up a, a democratic regime there um, that, that we, we hoped to inculcate our own uh, Western ideology with. Um, so I, I, I agree that, you know, we, we should exhaust all avenues of, of trying to, um, you know, remedy situations beyond just the military approach. Uh, in, in, in the military, we talk about DIME, you know, dipl diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. And I, I think if we take any approach that, that doesn't have all four of those uh, concepts built into it, it's pretty much destined for, for failure. But uh, I think that we did try to do some of that. It worked to an extent, and then it failed miserably in other extents. So uh, others want to address the, the topic? Um, I had a things, and then I'll, I'll head out, actually. But I was just going to say, one, hire more anthropologists. I think the military could use them. Uh, two, if we're going to do nation building, either do it full heartedly or don't do it half heartedly at all. Uh, don't do it at all. Uh, so if you're going to get into these things, then we need a kind of a department of nation building. We need an overhaul ground up rehauling of how we think about nation building theories of it and, and really what the plan is, because you can't just go into a place like Afghanistan like we did and have it be a one year commitment and then a five year commitment. And then, you know, you end up 20 years later and you don't know what you're doing. And then the last thing I'll say is that what, uh, you need a more honest accounting of your actual resources that you're pouring into any given situation at any given time. Uh, I know there was a moment when the United States felt it was invincible and could do everything all at once. But I, I think uh, from my perspective, going into Iraq in 2003 was the beginning of the end for what was happening in Afghanistan. Because I don't think the US had the uh, diplomatic or the political, especially the political will to go into both at the same time. And I think that uh, what happened in Iraq was a distraction and Afghanistan was very winnable. And it could have been, it could have been a very different country today if we hadn't, if what had happened in Iraq hadn't in 2003. And those are my thoughts and I'm gonna sign off soon. Thanks Andish. Yeah, Doc, I would like to add on this, like, uh, if we say that uh, regional players uh, are not enough to uh, solve this problem, we can say, we can see that in Myanmar, what has happened there, and what's the Asian role there. Uh, and if you would say that about the uh, problem of Taiwan and the, what happened in the Galwan Valley in the in, in uh, last summer 2020, if China attacks again on, on Indian border, then where, where, the, where India would go for the help? Like definitely it's, in, it's America, like uh, who preserves the value of democracy, who preserves the value of human rights. Definitely, um, I don't think that Russia would, would go and uh, Russia can talk about the democracy and human rights. So it's not about the only the regional players, it's about the values where we stand. I, 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 I endorse what Colonel Burjenska said about in, about in his reply in the last question. So that what we need, and I, 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 it's, uh, I fully agree with this, that United States uh, operation in, of 20 years has, has not failed totally. What we see in Afghanistan before 20 years and what is seeing it today, it is totally different. No matter Taliban captured, that was the, that was the inability and uh, incapacity of the political leaders of the Taliban. And, and do, do you see the radical change in Taliban policy and behavior? No matter, they are, uh, I, I know that they are doing something that's not going good, like, uh, like a journalist was telling us, but at least they are coming out of, the, out of their, their caves. They are doing the press conferences. They are saying that we want to be the part of the international community. What are the infrastructure? That's all that, that the, the United States did there. And it was the $2 trillion is not only spent on the Afghanistan, it was spent on Pakistan too. The infrastructure building in Pakistan, training of the Pakistan personnel. So they, they cheated us too. So, so we, have to, we have to take up all these things coming out. Like it's, it's not the failure of the United States. Like as, as a, I'm born in India, I'm living in the United States. And I, I preserve, I respect the United States, its military and its leadership because of the values that they put on. Thank you. Thank you, Indu. And, and you know, this isn't the first time that you know regional players have said that they want to be the solution to, to a problem and, and not been able to. If, if you go back to what we had to do in the former Yugoslavia, for example, 
it's the same situation. The Europeans kept saying, no, we'll take care of it. No, we'll take care of it. No, we'll take care of it. They didn't take care of it, right? Uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, Colonel Bajinska and, and uh, Colonel Straw could uh, talk to that more than I can, but, uh, you know, it, it, it took us going in there to make any positive difference and, and to stop the Serbs from doing what, what they were doing and other groups as far as that goes. But, um, you know, it, regional powers are, you know, they're, they're, they don't have the resources that we have. Uh, but they should be part of the solution, but they're, they're never going to be able to do it unilaterally, probably. Dr. Rockwell. Yes, sir. So one of the things, if I have just a quick minute, I I'm actually going to have to leave. Um, I hope you don't mind that I stayed over. Uh, no, not at all. The, the intriguing discussion is always uh, intellectually valuable. As a strategist, there's a couple of things I look at that, that I think I would offer for consideration with the future for Afghanistan. The first one is that the accountability media wise, and when I say media, I'm talking about anybody with an iPhone is potentially a, a media member. The, the accountability that's gonna be exacted on the Taliban's behavior over the next several months is more substantial than it was when all of this kicked off in September of 2001. So I think that they understand that the, the community of re reason that is the international realm is gonna have access to snippets of how they're actually reinforcing their stated intentions. And with that being said, I think of I think of how the Taliban accomplished this. In essence, they diplomatically made their way through the country by negotiating at the provincial level, so that ANA or Afghan National Army uh, soldiers and organizations did not resist or didn't resist to the level they could have. Part of that was a lack of faith in other entities from the Afghan government due to failure in resourcing their efforts. I can't speak to that. But that caused the Taliban to move much more quickly than I believe, I know that I thought was possible. And as a result of that, they did not have to conquer through bloodletting their way into the capital. So now you have an organization that has taken the seat of the government without this frothing of anger and vengeance that a lot of conquering armies may actually bring to the battlefield. That could potentially buy a level of sanity that wouldn't have been there had it been an exacting conflict for them to take what they now have. And then the last thing I would offer is there are always going to be pockets of violence. But I'm curious to see if this is what's adopted as the policy versus bad actors who now have stumbled on to a permissive environment that allows them to do some things that they really know in their heart are not acceptable. So between the Taliban not being in this hardening, bitter fight to get to the capital with their ability to use in an effect low, low level diplomatic efforts to, to earn their way through without having to shed blood as, as to the level they might have. And with the level of accountability that globalization now will afford, I, I am hopeful, and that's really the term I'm gonna use, I'm hopeful that this will create a unique circumstance where maybe they do, they do open themselves up to, to other influencers than just their own perceived to be small-minded ideals. And, and in that instance, if the Taliban can somehow gain legitimacy through negotiations and responsible behavior, they would not have to turn to gaining legitimacy by opening up their borders as a safe haven for illegitimate violent actors wanting to export other ideologies. This is a long-winded way to say, 
I hope they realize that everybody on this planet is watching their behavior and that their behavior could be tempered by the lack of anger and violence that we see at the conclusion of most conflicts. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts and anyone else's thoughts as I try as I might to hold out a little bit of optimism that, that this could go less violently than it could have in 2001, over. Yeah, I, I definitely uh, applaud your optimism and, uh, and, and appreciate your keen insight. Uh, I don't fully share the optimism. Uh, I, I'd like to, um, I just, the, the Taliban is a, a particular animal, if you will, uh, that, that doesn't, it defies logic in quite frequently. And, uh, you know, I, I am hopeful that, you know, the, the, the fact that they didn't have to whip themselves into a, a bloody, frothy, uh, rabid uh, nature in, in, in taking the country might temper them, at least temporarily. Uh, but I, I think the, the instance that, the, the, that they have any pushback and we saw this a little bit yesterday with the the the, uh, the celebrations of Afghan Independence Day. They were pretty quick to go out and bash some heads. Uh, we see it a little bit with them going door to door trying to find folks that helped us out, and and you know, in, in some instances, you know, shooting family members of of journalists who uh, are working in the West. Um, you know, that kind of gives a peek behind the mask. I think a little bit of, of what's out there. I think they're they're doing. They've taken lessons learned. Uh, from ISIS in terms of how they market themselves now. Uh, they're, they're much more tech savvy uh, than, than what they were before, uh, which is kind of uh, oxymoronic when you consider they're, they're almost the, uh, if, if, if the Amish were militant and uh, Islamic, then uh, they, they would you know, be something akin to, to what we have with the Taliban. So it's kind of interesting to see them using the tools that they despise uh, to, to kind of sell themselves as, as uh, a kinder and gentler uh, organization than, than what they were when they were last in power. Um, but, you know, I, I would be dearly love to be proven wrong. And uh, I hope that your, your optimism is, is, is well placed. I, I am, I am not, I am optimistic, but I am not resigned that the outcome is going to be clean. And, and so as a strategist, you hope for the best, but we all know what the charge is to plan for. Absolutely. Sir, I'm going to sign out. I would like to thank everybody for their time and their patience as I dominated the, the after party. I apologize. Um, this was an awesome, awesome opportunity, and uh, you helped me uh, understand more clearly through a participative environment where all the insights are, are underpinned by experiences and education in different realms and and scholarship and intellect is the way ahead and this venue maximizes that so kudos to you sir for providing this opportunity and i look forward to uh listening in on other sessions please have a great rest of your week thank you sir and we'll be inviting you to other forums too so thank you bye <laughs> any other questions out there Going once, going twice. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close out. Uh, again, thank you for participating. I have a, a question, sir. Oh, sure, sure, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, greetings from Colombia, South America. I am a student of international relations and political studies. Mm -hmm. Here we have, let's say like our own problems with our peace agreements. We've seen that we kind of were some sort of lacking with uh, guerrilla groups and so on. So we see the FARC is already armed. Uh, we didn't disarm them well. The peace agreement only gave them political power. Now we're seeing uh, other members of other guerrilla and uh, outlaw groups from way before I was born to reappear as armed um, components in our country. And so taking this into account and seeing Afghanistan, what has the international community seen from well, their own peace process and what have we learned? Since the process is in Afghanistan never ended since well, the country kind of has fell 
before the, the peace process ended. How is the um, Taliban peace agreements with the US and with Afghanistan has been um, shown to have worked or to have failed? And also how do ancient militants like Hezbe Islami being participant now that the government has changed? Anybody else want to tackle that? I guess not. Um, yeah, you bring up a lot of interesting points. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that, that, that the lessons learned in, in uh, remote locations uh, to, to the, the particular instance of Afghanistan have, have, have truly been applied. Um, you know, your, your own experience with FARC, uh, you know, Peru's with, uh, with Shining Path, and, and you know the countless other uh, instances in, in Central America from, from back in the, the 70s, 80s, and, and, and 90s. I don't know that the lessons learned there have, have been adequately applied elsewhere. Um, and, and you know, I, I don't think that we're really, we're, we're kind of to, to some extent comparing apples and oranges because there, there has been no um, Demilitarization of the conflict, or, or de-escalation in the conflict, I guess, in Afghanistan since you know, time immemorial to some extent. Now you can go back to the Mahabharata and and, and read about uh, you know, Afghan participation in the Kurukshetra War, for example, uh, with uh, uh, some of the generals and even with the dice game. Uh, and, and so the, the, the violence has always been there, whether it's, you know, inter-clan or whether it's inter-ethnic or, or whether it's, you know, the central government versus, versus the perimeter. They, so the, these, uh, these folks have not been disarmed. They've not been disbanded. Uh, and any time that they're uh, greatly threatened, they essentially just kind of uh, cross over the border into either Pakistan or one of the other stands and, and regroup. And then and then come back out when or go into a cave and then come back out uh, when when it's a, a little bit safer for them to do so. I do think that you know if there is some effort on the part of the Taliban uh, to have uh, some kind of reconciliation uh, commission or something akin to what what was uh, enacted perhaps after South Africa uh, in the demise of, of apartheid. You know, if they were to do something of that, where folks could come up and you know, you know basically beg for forgiveness uh, for their past uh, militant activity and everything, you know, maybe at that point then we start seeing some of these uh, folks do something of that nature. But again, you know, the the rivalries and um, divisions within Afghanistan are, are much more, I think, significant than what we find in some of these, uh, some other countries, including Colombia. I mean, Colombia is a viable state. Uh, it, at, at times, it's, it's been more viable than others, uh, but uh, people there, you know, at least in my experience, and, and we've hosted uh, Colombian international officers here in, in our family, um, you, you think of yourself as, as Colombians first, and just like we think of ourselves as Americans first or Anvesh and his, his uh, family consider themselves Canadian first. Uh, Afghans are, are not necessarily in, in that same boat, at least in, in, in my understanding, uh, where you know the ethnicity or the clan or the religion uh, come first as opposed to being Afghan uh, uh, as your primary identity. And this is true in, 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 in similar other, uh, several other uh, countries in, in the region and, and throughout the world, really, where you have uh, essentially a uh, superimposed map over a, a bunch of folks that are just kind of tossed in together, either through you know, colonial constructs or you know, past wars or, or, or the demise of, a, of a, a former large empire that basically, you know, th this is the chunk that was left over. And so everybody that's there is now magically an Afghan, even though they don't think of themselves that way. So I, I think we're com somewhat comparing apples and oranges, but there could be some lessons learned there as to, you know, how, how if the Taliban wanted to, you know, make the central government actually something uh, worthy of calling a central government, and if they were uh, aimed at reconciliation, uh, then, then, you know, lead by example first, you know, come clean of your own sins, and, and then maybe others would follow suit. And, and that would be the, probably the only way that I think some of these lessons learned could actually be applied to, to this particular um, 
environment. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'm going to conclude. And again, uh, thank you all for your participation. And, and thank you for, uh, you know, sticking around for this kind of after hour uh, chit chat. Uh, this, this portion will not be up on, on the website. Uh, but again, you know, the questions here will help uh, that, that were posed here in the, uh, the after show, we'll, we'll try to take some of those and, and reformulate those for future uh, sessions with uh, uh, some of the same uh, panelists, but, but some different panelists as well. So thanks again, and y'all have a great weekend.